Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. I'm going to talk about uh, an introduction to neonatal precal plexus palsy. I will discuss the types, the history, examination, differential diagnosis, natural history, principles of management, and late sequelae. But because of the restriction of time, I will discuss only shorter late uh, sequelae. Neonatal brachial plexus palsy is classified into partial or total. Partial means injury of C5-6 only. Extended partial is C5-6-7. And total involvement of all roots of the brachial plexus from C5 to T1. And uh, a characteristic type of, C5, of total brachial plexus palsy is the association with positive Horner uh, syndrome. We have to think of presence of brachial plexus palsy if there is neonatal immediate postpartum immobility of the upper limb. Uh, in a patient uh, with in a mother with a history of vaginal delivery, difficult labor, obstructed labor, large birth weight, or breach presentation. Presence of difficulty of labor and presence of this caput secundum may is an indicative of obstructed labor and uh, should point to the presence of brachial plexus palsy if there is immediate immobility of the upper limb. During examination, what we need to know? We want to Diagnose first, is it a neonatal brachial plexus or not? And if it is, then what type? Later assessment is of the deficit, the progressive recovery, or the presence of late sequelae. <laughs> we have one of the most common causes that may be misdiagnosed as uh, brachial plexus palsy is infection, uh, neonatal septic shoulder, okay, this all infections or all painful injuries of the upper limb produce what's called pseudo paralysis that could be misdiagnosed as brachial plexus palsy. The most common injuries is fracture of the clavicle or slipping of the proximal humeral epiphysis or slipping of the distal humeral epiphysis. All these are neonatal injuries that be misdiagnosed, that may be misdiagnosed as brachial plexus palsy. Also, the presence of neonatal contractures is should be diagnosed as arthrogryposis and not brachial plexus palsy. I would like to thank my uh, brother, Dr. Mustafa Mahmoud, for these nice videos. There are other paralytic conditions that may uh, affect the movement of the upper limb. One of the most common causes uh, uh, is cerebral uh, palsy. So during the examination, we have to examine uh, how to do some reflexes, neonatal reflexes, like the Mori reflex and the grasp reflex. If there is true immobility of the upper limb, this upper limb will not reflex. I will not flex with moral reflex or there is no grasp uh, reflex if there is total brachial plexus injury. Looking at the hand could differentiate immediately between total and partial injury. Looking at the hand, if there is no mobility of flexion of, uh, there is no flexion of the fingers or lack or uh, intrinsic minus posture, this is diagnosed as total brachial plexus palsy. But if there is good uh, hand, this is not total brachial plexus palsy. Once we diagnose total brachial palsy, we have to look. We have to look at the eye. If there is Horner syndrome or not, because. Horner syndrome carry very poor prognosis for the case and indicate the presence of avulsion of C8 uh, T1 roots. If there is good hand function, then we have to look at the rest. 
if there is no active extension of the wrist, this is extended partial injury, C5, 6, 7. If there is good extension of the wrist, then we have to look at the shoulder and the elbow. And if there is no movement of the shoulder and the elbow, then this is a partial plexus palsy that affects the five, six roots only. So it is a clinical diagnosis. There is no rule of EMG early to diagnose plexus plexus palsy. And if it is going to be done, it should be done at least three weeks of, uh, of age and not before that. The natural history, the, the C5-6 injury can have a very good prognosis and 90 or 85% of the cases recovers spontaneously. The extended partial injury, 65% improve and recover. And in uh, the total plexus, plexus, the recovery, complete recovery is less than 50%. If there is Horner syndrome, it is 0% for the hand to recover. The management of neonatal brachial plex palsy is follow-up waiting for re innervation early microsurgical reconstruction, and then and later on, secondary reconstruction for the presence of sequelae of brachial plex palsy. During innervation or waiting for re innervation either after microsurgical reconstruction or before microsurgical reconstruction, we have to maintain full range of movement to, pre to prevent development of uh, contraction and we have to teach this uh, range of motion exercise to the mother. The microsurgical reconstruction is indicated very early when we know there is very poor prognosis and this is indicated early in life during the first three months of life in case of total neurator brachial plex palsy plus Horner syndrome or total injury without recovery of the hand by the age of three months. And the priority in microsurgical reconstruction is for the hand. This is not a case of other brachial plex palsy where the priority goes to the elbows and the shoulder. No, in neonatal brachial plex palsy, uh, the priority is for the hand because there, uh, there is a very little window for secondary reconstruction for hand paralysis. In case of partial lesion, if there is no recovery of the biceps active movement of the biceps active flexion of the elbow by the age of six months, and the patient is unable to pick a cookie and put it on the hand, this is indication for microsurgical reconstruction in partial lesion. The later sequelae of the, new, of the neonatal, neonatal plexus plex palsy uh, uh, is managed by secondary reconstruction. Uh, there is higher incidence of sequelae in presence of total injuries and little in presence of partial injuries. And usually there is complete recovery in partial injuries if the biceps recover by the age of three months or before the age of three months. The, little, the later sequelae or late sequelae affect the shoulder, the elbow, the forearm, and the hand. The shoulder is the most common to be uh, affected and to have later sequelae of brachial plexus uh, palsy. And the shoulder sequelae is related to the severity of the injury and the type of microsurgical reconstruction. Sometimes we take all the nerve supply of the shoulder and give it to the hand and this leave the shoulder paralytic. And this may be a cause of later sequelae of brachial plexus palsy. The type of shoulder sequelae if there is no innervation, there will be a flaccid paralysis, flaccid shoulder. If there is incomplete re-innervation, there will be internal rotation contracture or external rotation contracture or combined internal and external rotation contracture, abduction contracture, or in some cases, very weak abduction. The flail shoulder, the best treatment for flare shoulder is arthrodesis of the shoulder. And this very good, give a very good uh, function of the shoulder through transforming the upper limb movement to the thoracohumeral movement. Sorry, the scapulothoracic uh, movement. In presence of contractures, uh, in, in partially innervation, and in presence of contracture and weakness, this uh, gave us 
the different types of contracture. The most common is internal rotation contracture. There is no passive external rotation of the shoulder while it is uh, in adduction. And the, the main cause of internal rotation contraction is subscapularis uh, contracture. We have to test internal rotation while the shoulder is adducted because once we do abduction, we may get external rotation range of motion because the, the subscapularis will restrict the external rotation only in abduction and not in abduction. And once we do passive external rotation, because there is limitation, there will be scapular, positive scapular elevation sign. It is very clear here, the, the scapula elevate with external rotation, indicating the presence of internal rotation contracture. With internal rotation contracture, there is variable degree of shoulder abduction. It may be very good or may be limited. Here, almost full abduction range, although there is passive limitation of external rotation range. Here, patient with internal rotation contraction, and in spite of that, he is able to do almost full abduction of the shoulder. To diagnose internal rotation contraction, there should be full internal rotation range, but the limitation only is limited to passive external rotation range. There is variable degree and may reach up to posterior shoulder dislocation, even in a case like this with severe cleft here indicating the posterior shoulder dislocation. External rotation contracture usually follow treatment of internal rotation contracture or follow early microsurgical reconstruction. And in these cases, the patient is not able to put the hand on the abdomen with the wrist extended. And sometimes it may be very severe that the child is not able to reach his uh, mouth. Combined external rotation and internal rotation contracture is usually missed and usually diagnosed as an internal rotation contracture. So it is important to test passive range of internal rotation to ensure full range of internal rotation to diagnose the patient as having only internal rotation contracture. Abduction contracture, usually it is good there's no need to treat it because it helps in abduction range and very limited abduction range may indicate that this patient is not fit for uh, tendon transfers around the shoulder. The treatment of internal rotation contraction is by passive exercise, soft tissue surgery or derotation osteotomy. And uh, the soft tissue contracture is by doing release of the subscapularis plus or minus tendon transfers if there is weak abduction and weak active external rotation. Uh, the, 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 the prerequisite to do tendon transfer or release is the presence of minimum of abduction more than 30 degrees. How to treat internal rotation contracture? We prefer doing uh, subscapularis sliding and but once we do subscapularis sliding then we have passive external rotation without scapular elevation uh, lattice mass transfer is done when there is weak active external rotation of the shoulder and transfer to the uh, rotator cuff this is an example of patients treated with tendon transfer and uh, subscapularis sliding. I'm going fast because of the limitation of time. Uh, we have a paper published for tendon transfer to treat internal rotation contractures. Uh, it's preferred to do single muscle transfer, which is latissimus torsi, and to avoid double muscle transfer. In older patients with deformity of the green humeral articulation or missed this long standing dislocation, then it's best to treat him with derotation osteotomy. So, neonatal brachial plexus, broad spectrum of deformities and deficit, and nervation are variable according to age, degree of affection, natural history, and patient perspectives. The earlier the management, the better the results. 
lots of controversies and techniques, but no consensus or solid evidence in many aspects of management. Thank you so much.